Welcome everyone to Leaders and Changemakers, a series by the Boston College Media Alumni Network showcasing inspiring leaders with valuable stories to share. My name is Chris Russo and I'm the president and founder of the BC Media Alumni Network. I also run Russo Strategic Partners, a consulting firm specializing in content creation and strategic partnerships. Thanks so much to everybody who's here joining us live tonight. Please feel free to use the chat to ask with questions. I'll be keeping an eye on the chat tonight to make sure that your questions are answered during our conversation. I am so excited tonight to welcome our guest, Leslie Visser. Leslie is the most highly acclaimed female sportscaster of all time. She has broken barriers for more than 40 years in the male dominated field of sports. And she is the first woman to win the Emmy Sports Lifetime Achievement Award, which she just accepted earlier this week. We're gonna talk about that in a moment. Leslie is the only sportscaster, male or female, to have worked on the network broadcast of, get ready for this list, the Final Four, the Super Bowl, the World Series, the NBA Finals, the Triple Crown, the Olympics, the US Open, and last but not least, the World Figure Skating Championship. That's a lot of sports coverage. <laughs> so Leslie <laughs> joins us tonight to share how she overcame many obstacles in the industry and rose to the top. Leslie, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Oh, Chris, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm honored, I'm a very proud Boston College graduate, and I wrote for the high school. BC really gave me my start. Oh, wow. Okay, we're going we're gonna to talk about that uh, in a few moments. But first off, again, congratulations on winning the Sports uh, Lifetime Achievement Award from the Sports Emmys. How did it feel getting that email or that call saying that you won that award? Uh, thank you for asking. You know, for I'm sure some of you, the people watching or eventually some of Chris will be in a Hall of Fame. And it's, it's nothing you can aspire to. It... Uh, when I was privileged to go in to be, be the first woman in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, John Madden wrote me a note and he said, the Hall of Fame, you can't be born into it, you can't buy your way into it, you have to earn it. So it was completely unexpected and the call I got was from actually my boss, the chairman of CBS Sports, as you may well know, is Sean McManus, uh, the son of Jim McKay. Can you imagine they made Jim McKay changed his name from McManus to McKay, but uh, Sean called to tell me, and a couple nights ago when I accepted the award, it was the virtual, uh, it was to be at Lincoln Center, but of course it was virtual, and I said that I promised Sean McManus that I would not blither the way <laughs> that I did when he called me, because it was so unexpected, and the list of winners are people that either I revered or I worked with. Um, I grew up listening to Kirk Gowdy on Cheap Transistors calling Red Sox game. Kirk Gowdy was the second winner of the Lifetime Achievement Sports Emmy. And many of the winners I had the privilege with Dick Enberg and John Madden, Pat Summerall, Al Michael, uh, Quist. So it was really quite powerful. And you accepted the award, as you said, virtually uh, earlier this week on Tuesday, and then you actually paid it forward by presenting the Jim McKay Scholarship to a student sports journalist. Paying it forward is, is something that you've really done a lot of. Why is it so important to you to continue to pay it forward? Oh, I think it's because um, at first I was always the only one, and sort of the thinking uh, there was a, a, a group of real talented women. I started at the Boston Globe in 1974 on a Carnegie Foundation grant. And I was really always the only woman at so many events. And then there was a class behind me about five years later. We were all fantastic. It was Chris Brennan. Uh, she was uh, at the Miami. Then, of course, she was the first woman to cover the Redskins for the Washington Post. Sally Jenkins, Jackie McMullen. Uh, John Ed Howard. So there was this whole group of really talented women who wrote, who came right after me. And I, I was always thrilled because I, I had a couple of thoughts. Um, I didn't just want to be the first. I, I wanted to be the first of many. And, you know, that happened. Um, we still have many challenges today, as some of the recent news stories have told us. But um, I think women now really believe that it is you or me, that 
there's a whole pizza pie and you can have a slice, I can have a slice. And I think that served me well. And I think it served all women well. And your career is marked by a lot of firsts. You're the first woman to report from the Super Bowl sideline, the first and only woman in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, that's a big honor, and the first female NFL analyst on TV, just to name a few, those are all only football, by the way. Um, when you're the first at so many things, I have to wonder, who have you looked to as your role model? Did you have any mentors coming up in the industry? Sure, I have, um, I'm now in my 45th year, and I'm, I've been really fortunate. I've, I've kind of only played in the major leagues. I won a Carnegie Foundation grant, as I said, when I was a junior, sophomore, junior at Boston College. And I went to the Boston Globe, which always got voted the number one sports section in America. I mean, it was murderer's row, because you're probably a Yankee fan, right, Chris? Mm -hmm. I'm a New Yorker, so I just, I have to be. But uh, I've, no, I've you, my heart for the Red Sox. I'm a BC guy, so, you know. I, I no. went to Fenway and... No, you can't have both. You're born to... <laughs> no, you're a Yankee. But, but, anyway, right. the, but, yeah. Yeah, but the Boston Globe was murderer's row. I mean, it was the 27 Yankees. It was uh, Bud Collins on tennis, Peter Gammons on baseball, Bob Ryan on basketball, Will McDonough on football. In fact, when the Boston Globe made me the first woman to cover the NFL as a beat, it was because Will McDonough called Billy Sullivan, then the owner of the Patriots, and he said... We're going to have a woman on the beat, and that's that. <laughs> so uh, I, had, I had great support from those Globe guys, and they were really uh, my mentors. I, I've had four, I would say, in my four-decade career that really gave me the opportunities. Uh, Vince Doria uh, was, uh, he and Dave Smith were the editors, sports editors at the Boston Globe. Of course, Vince went on to run news at ESPN for about, I think, 25 years. I still talk to him all the time. Great guy. So Vince gave me tremendous opportunities. I mean, he sent me the Final Four. He'd send me the Super Bowl. I went to Wimbledon with Bud Collins. So I'm really great for young. I, I started the Globe. I think I was 20 years old. And uh, then uh, in TV, uh, there were two guys at CBS, Ted Shaker and Neil Pilsen. And they actually came up to Boston, and they said that they had a woman who knew television, the great Phyllis George, but she didn't know sports. So they said, um, we know that you've covered all the sports and we'll teach you the TV, which um, if anyone <laughs> wants to hear, there were, I pretty much looked like I had uh, rigor mortis at first, <laughs> but uh, they gave me those opportunities. Then I went to ABC and there were a couple people there, uh, Jack O'Hara, who actually uh, died young in a, a terrible TWA crash on Long Island uh, well before 9-11. But uh, he and another guy, Dennis Swanson, ran ABC Sports. And when CBS lost football, we lost the NFL in 93. It went to Fox. That's when Fox came in. So I went to Monday Night Football. So at ABC, they gave me the opportunity. And all of these places, I was the first. And then uh, now I'm back at, at CBS. And uh, I'm really comfortable. Really, um, a guy, Sean McManus, Jim McKay's son, um, he, he took me now 15 years ago, and he's kept me ever since. So I really have those four men to thank for my opportunities. That's incredible. Yeah, just before we went on, we were talking about CBS. I was a CBS News intern a couple summers ago, and I was just telling you how much I loved my experience at CBS. And I think there are some of the most uh, talented and smart people there, especially uh, in, the, in the news department. I think Susan Zerinsky is doing a great job, and is, uh, there are so many great people over there. Um, I want to go back to CBS one day, uh, but <laughs> well, you know. Susan Zerinsky, she she answers her emails and stuff. And you know what? Uh, thank you for saying that because CBS uh, working at CBS really makes you sit up a little straighter. And uh, I was nervous. I told Sean McManus the other night I was nervous before accepting the Emmy, even though my husband Bob said, "Well, I'm pretty certain you're going to win because <laughs> they'd already told me I was, you know, they only give out one lifetime achievement." And uh, but working at CBS is, um, I think we all want to carry ourselves with the legacy that has been CBS. It's been. William Paley and Walter Cronkite and, you know, all the way through. I mean, look at the people we have now. It's Jim Nance, um, everybody. It's Greg Bull, 
um, people really handle themselves, I think, with a dignity that reflects CBS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and just to, to go back a little bit more, you, you knew that you wanted to be a sports reporter when you were 10 years old. And your mother gave you a very special piece of advice. She said, Leslie, sometimes you have to cross when it says don't walk. How did you take that advice and implement it into your professional career? Oh, I, I just, I had a for sports, the way other kids love music or poetry. I was somebody, my family moved a lot. My dad grew up in Amsterdam and really knew nothing of American sports. But my mom was a, a Celtic fan. I was born in Boston and I had a passion. I heard uh, for the box if, if they moved the over I, I learned to score uh, you know six to, six to four to three I think is the best play in baseball of course you don't see double plays much anymore unless it's <laughs> now the 10th inning but uh, doesn't it seem like baseball is just home runs or strikeouts yeah <laughs> yeah so um, I, I just sports and uh, I didn't consider how challenging it would be uh, the job when I told my mother we were living in Cincinnati and I was 10 years old I think 10 or 11 and my mom who was a teacher said to me uh, what do you think you might want to do when you grow up and I said you know what I want to be a sports writer well this was in 1963 and the job did not exist for women and my mother instead of saying oh you can't do that girls don't do that you know you're probably going to be uh, a secretary, a, a nurse, a teacher, a domestic, uh, or a homemaker. She's, that's great. Sometimes you have to cross when it says don't walk. And it became the title of my book, and it, it really set me free. I've had a few people tell me things over the years that have really stuck with me, and that was the first. And so how did you take that piece of advice with you and work it into your career? What Can you tell us about some of those times where the sign said, don't walk, and you crossed anyway. Well, I started writing for the Heights, which they hadn't had a woman, and I somehow survived Mike Lupica as my sports editor, <laughs> along with the great Lenny DeLuca. And uh, it, I just knew, you know, I wanted to be a sports writer. And um, of course, Mike and Lenny would take all the great BC trips, you know, down Texas A&M. By the way, do you know that Texas A&M, and maybe for all of you out there, they, according to Forbes magazine, they have the highest revenue of any football program in America. What do you think it is, Chris? Oh boy, a uh, hundred million dollars. I'm making it up. I don't know. That's, a, that's not a bad stab. It's um, 147 million, which wow. um, like Florida State that you know Boston College faces and the ACC, I think their revenue is something like 103 million mm -hmm. and in Boston College of course everyone gets a piece of the ACC TV money but you know we are not anywhere near it, that kind of company but anyway so Mike Lupica and Lenny I mean they were just giants and um, Boston College had a tradition of sports writers of course Bob Ryan went there and as a matter of fact for both Bob Ryan Mike, Mike Lupica and myself we all, our favorite professor at Boston College was the same guy, Paul Doherty, who ran the English department. I think he read James Joyce in Latin or something, but uh, I learned a great deal from him. So uh, in my uh, sophomore year, I heard about this Carnegie Foundation grant, which by the way, for anybody who's young watching this, internships are the way to go. Uh, then you know somebody does not have to commit to a salary right away. But the Carnegie Corporation gave out 20 uh, scholarships to women who wanted to go into jobs that were 95% male, which I know it sounds like the 1800s, but this was 1973 when I applied. And uh, a woman from Michigan got it for archaeology, a woman from Johns Hopkins got it for ophthalmology. I, um, we had a series of reviews uh, down in New York, Pittsburgh, the Carnegie Foundation and Carnegie Foundation, and I got one of them for sports writing. So my first year at the Globe, uh, 19, my summer, I was at Boston College, 1974, and um, I worked at the Globe all summer, and then the Globe hired me. So I've actually known those nitwits like Dan Shaughnessy for like 45 years. 
<laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, I have to say, you know, even when you went on the field after that, you, you got into your career, you were on the field. I was watching an interview earlier where you said, you, you know, near the press box, there was no women's restroom. Locker, no women's restrooms because women weren't in those areas, and you had to actually take the elevator down and go across the street to the only public restroom for women. So there was probably a lot of times where you you were there, but you kind of felt like an outsider. Can you tell us a little bit more about maybe a time where you felt that you know you weren't taken as seriously as your peers because the fact that you were a woman? Oh, that would fill seven hours. Um, I uh, yes the. Boston Globe, really enormous opportunity to make me the first woman to um, the NFL as a beat. And I was young and I was terrified. And the credentials that I wore to go to an NFL game, uh, the Patriots, uh, right on the credential, it said, no women or children in the press box, which, you know, not only the irony of me wearing that, but it, yeah, it was diminishing. Um, Writers were always great. I have to say that. And yes, there, because there'd never been a woman, there were no ladies' room. So, um, the patients uh, in 1975 were not the gold standard that they are. Now. So I would have to time it. You know, Patriots had the ball first and 10 on their own 20. And I would have to go down, see if I could run in the restroom and come back up before they punted, you know, once a half. And uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was a real challenge. But I, I felt um, I felt really blessed to have the opportunity, and I I didn't want to complain to the Globe because I didn't want them to say, oh, maybe we made a mistake, maybe a woman can't do it, and I didn't want to complain to the NFL because they might say the same thing. So, um, you know, I have a lot of scar tissue, but on balance, I mean, gosh, I was able to cover Super Bowls when I was 23 years old, so. Uh, and, you know, and then it went on. I, I, my first TV assignment for CBS, I worked for both and CBS, and my first assignment for CBS, like Lakers Celtics series in 84. So, I mean, I've just had, and, you know, all, I think I've done 30, like six Final Fours and 35 Super Bowls. So I, I just could not find anywhere to complain. Was there ever a moment for you where you felt like you sat back and you were just like, I think I've made it? No, I remember reading once another Yankee, Joe DiMaggio. Uh, he was asked sometimes, you know, why against some cellar dweller, why, why he paid such attention, so he was so precise. And uh, he said, because um, I make sure that every at is a at bat. And that would be part of my advice to anyone that uh, there is no assignment big or small. There is no market big or small because you can be found wherever you work. You know, some people, especially when I lived in New York, a lot of young people thought they could only work in New York, but in some ways it constrained them because you, Chris, if you had gone and been an on-air news reporter, maybe in, you know, Albuquerque or Des Moines, then you wouldn't have been at the big place with such a small role. Absolutely. Just being grateful for, for every opportunity that, that you have and every opportunity that you can take. I think that's such a great outlook uh, to have. We have a question from uh, one of our viewers, Katie. Um, Katie is asking, what advice would you give to someone who freelances as a broadcaster and or a correspondent online, but hasn't yet figured out how to break into the network side of things for coverage? Uh, maybe in a more obscure event like America's Cup. Would you recommend going to get a master's in journalism to boost your career or pivot? H how do you get into that, that network TV side of things? Oh, that's a great question. And Katie, you have to get back to me when you do get there. Uh, there are a few things you can do. Number one, um, in order to be hired um, by a network, and I think when you watch people on the network, especially the women, you know that they know what they're looking at. You know that you can trust Tracy Wilson at CBS or Jamie Erdahl or Ali LaForce at T or uh, Michelle Tafoya or Culver. You know, all these people are Aaron Andrews. You know that they know what they're looking at. So you must have knowledge. Knowledge is unassailable and knowledge will give you confidence. Uh, you also need passion, like I, I said 
from, I was blessed with a childhood passion, but if you love it, don't do it because the people who do get there are passionate about it. They don't notice the hours. They don't really notice the salary. They, they notice that, my gosh, I am having the time of my life, even the really hard parts. And I stood out in the rain for many, many NFL games, snow, nothing's colder than Lambeau in January, but nothing's better than Lambeau in January. And the third is you have to have stamina. There are gonna be lousy years, crummy assignments, but you need to bring in. Uh, two specific, I would say, are one, your, um, your tape short. People get the idea. They look at thousands of them. You don't need five minutes. They're, they're going to decide on you probably in 45 seconds. So what you want to do is maybe the first thing doesn't show that you can read off a teleprompter because that's really not a difficult area of our business. What you want to show is you're interviewing somebody and you are thinking on your feet, not just that you have a list of questions. And then, and so you want to show that you ask something that he or she couldn't just automatically respond to, and you have tape of that. Secondly, I would find out, I would find an agent, somebody who takes young people and say a couple things. May I Zoom with you? Uh, how, how, may I get in touch with you? And, uh, you know, I'm willing to start anywhere and cover anything. And the America's Cup, by the way, I have the privilege of covering that. Uh, my dad was a sailor from Amsterdam, and it's a great event. Don't ever think that. Not a great it is. May Tai wants to know um, from a cultural cultural perspective, do you think men's sports are adequately accepting of women reporters today, or are there still significant barriers to success for women in sports journalism? Is this the same woman who I thought your name was Katie? What's her name? Uh, May Tai, I believe is. Oh. I'm, I apologize, Maytai. And I remember when America first um, really caught on to the America's Cup was when it was held in um, Fremantle, maybe, uh, 35 years ago. Dennis Conner, the America's Cup, that's when America, because, you know, we like to win. And uh, if we're not going to win it, we're not really interested. But um, I do think that men are very accepting, but it's not constant forward progress. Uh, like I said, you, you can you see women now in all areas. There is a woman, Molly Solomon, who is the executive producer of the Golf Channel. That's you know that's as high as you can go on the production side in sports. There are women executives. There are women uh, play-by-play. -play. There's Susan Waldman, who's been doing the Yankees for 20 years. Uh, the Baltimore Orioles just hired a woman. So you can aspire to do anything. That that's the great part. But it's not always complete forward progress. Uh, the Washington Redskins, or then the Redskins, um, thank God they changed. But uh, the Washington football team just two or three weeks ago had 15 women cite areas of sexual harassment. And I know some of those women, and they were not making this up. So it's kind of, you have to go into this thinking that ground gained is not always secured. Absolutely. Um, we only have a few minutes left and I want to get in all the questions I, I want to ask. Sure. What, so you reported in a lot of different sports. What was your favorite sports moment that you witnessed while you were right there on the sidelines? Oh gosh, because I've actually had the privilege at, at all, all the sports at the highest level. And um, I've done some features that were very profound to me. Uh, CBS sent me to the fall of the Berlin Wall to see how sports would change in Germany. And that was very, very powerful. My dad grew up under the Nazi occupation. Uh, Holland was liberated in 45. And, you know, everybody was starving. Everybody was helping their neighbors. So to see the Berlin Wall come down for me was, you know, a story of the century. And um, I did a, a story in uh, HBO, Real Sports sent me to Shanghai when Yao Ming, it was still communist, and Yao Ming had not yet come to the NBA. So I've had the privilege of those kinds of stories. But um, my favorite day of the year is the semifinals of the Final Four, because everybody has a chance and the, the crowd is passionate. All four schools have reason to believe. And, uh, you know, I think like 10 years ago was when Gordon Hayward um, shot that 
prayer shot that almost beat Memphis. And when you talk to Gordon, for those who remember that, that championship game, it was the shot before that. It was down on the right baseline. And that kind of footer that he missed, that's the one that he knew won Butler the title. But you have those moments. Uh, you know, I was at Villa Georgetown in, in 85. That was as close to sports perfection as I have seen. Georgetown was secretariat. They were the defending national champion. Villanova barely got into the tournament and they played almost a perfect game. They, they missed only one shot in the second half. So I always say the great thing about sports is that it's unscripted. So you do not know what's going to happen. And that makes it all the more exciting to report on and, and be right there to cover. I think that's, that's fantastic. Um, I want to go back uh, to talk about the Heights a little bit, because that's another thing you and I have in common. I was, I was the news editor on the Heights for a couple years. And, uh, you know, the Heights, uh, when, when I was there, was a, it's independent uh, of the university. I don't believe it was at the time that you were there, but now it's an independent student newspaper. And um, I really feel like we owe a lot to student journalists because, you know, they work really, really hard. They're covering the important issues. And also it's, it's such a great opportunity to really develop your writing skills, uh, your interviewing skills, your interpersonal skills. Have you gotten the chance to speak with any student journalists uh, over the past few years and, and mentor them maybe? Uh, yeah, I spoke at the Heights for the 100th anniversaries and we've done a couple of Zooms. And I think I've taught now at um, probably about 25 schools around the country doing something just like this. And I love young journalists. And I, I would love to know right now what Boston College reporters, what kind of access do they have during this? What kind of protocols have they learned that Boston College, that football is... Um, you know, during this time practices. And then going forward, how is it going to be maintained um, once students are on campus and they're going to the games? I, I would love to uh, hear, so I hope if there are any BC journalists or any journalists, I, I, I'd love to hear from you because I think that is exactly where you can make mistakes and you, you, you work on, on your writing and you work on, uh, you know, all kinds of things you, you learn that said is the best word, that you don't need an adverb after you quote someone, just say said. <laughs> the quote should carry it. I learned that the tough way when I first got there. I was, you know, I came from a more of like a creative writing background. So I was like using all types of synonyms to said, and they were like, no, Chris, just you said. Okay, note taken. <laughs> I was like, that's uh, it. So, well, and you know what? It's uh, the Globe was a writer's paper. You know, they, they would send send us on, uh, there was a, a wayward running back from uh, Oklahoma named Marcus Dupree who lived in Philadelphia, Mississippi, which had been the of uh, three young black men had been murdered during the civil rights. And the Globe sent me, imagine a newspaper doing this, for four days to sit outside his house if he would come out and speak to me. And I had to, had to develop all kinds of sources in the town of Philadelphia, Mississippi, and um, there were cell phones, so I would have to wait, you know, kind of like something out of hand till his pastor came out of the house as minister. But uh, the Globe, um, it was a writer's paper. So for me, it, it really set the tone because I, I wrote on deadline for everything, for you know, uh, baseball and football and tennis and basketball. And then we would have these large feature stories that we were assigned to. So um, college is the place to start. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to say, Leslie, thank you so much for, for being here with us tonight. Um, I really appreciate you joining our um, really exciting lineup of, of speakers that we have for this series, and I'll keep you up to date with all, all the people we have coming up, because I think you might find a few of them interesting. Um, to everyone tuning in, thank you so much for joining us. I always like to say the conversation doesn't end here. Please give a look out for us on social media, at BC Media Alumni. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We'll be posting uh, the, our full episode up on YouTube as well. And it's a way to kind of stay connected with all the BC alums uh, in the media space. Leslie, thank you so much again uh, for joining us. Congrats on the Sports Emmy Lifetime Achievement Award. What a great honor. And um, hopefully we'll chat again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And thanks to all for joining in. Thank you.